Recording? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, we continue. This is uh, lecture number three, International Business. Uh, we are chapter one. We continue with section four. We just finished section three on global institutions. And these are drivers of globalization. Drivers of globalization. So, what are the drivers of globalization? Number one, declining trade barriers. A trade barrier is an impediment to trade is somehow the government or local business preventing foreign competition from entering the market. Well, right after World War II, there's been significant barriers to trade. And over the last 70 years, governments have steadily lowered those barriers. They may have lowered them because they've seen that there is a true benefit for themselves to lower the barriers, but also, but also because they have been forced or pressured by the GATT, WTO, World Bank, and so on. Now, let's discuss the extreme opposite of declining barriers to trade so that you understand what's really happening. Uh, and it's fairly simple and straightforward. World War II, you got Germany up against the rest of the world, let's say the UK. The first thing you want to do if you're Germany and want to beat the British is a blockade. Blockade. What is a blockade? Blockade is stopping all goods services and people moving in and out of the country. You choke the country. The country can't get resources, can't get capital, can't get practically anything from the rest of the world. This weakens the local economy. This is the strategy that every military, experienced military leader would, in general would know. You want to circle around and the economy slowly dies. Of, of course, I mean, that's what uh, even, what is it? A uh, few hundred, what is it, six, seven hundred years ago? Uh, six hundred years ago, the Germans going all the way to Vienna and they got the blockade of Vienna. And it just slowly starved the economy to death or you slowly starve the city to death. So a blockade is you impose the ultimate trade barrier where goods and services and people can't move in and out. And this is proven for thousands of years to work perfectly, to choke and kill the local economy, to force the local economy to surrender, okay? So, a blockade is what you do when you want to kill the economy. And it's proven for thousands of years to work perfectly. Okay? So the opposite, so blockade is the ultimate, the maximum trade barrier possible. Well, governments get to realize that by keeping trade barriers high, they keep the local economy poor. And that's very, very well and easily seen in Cuba, where Trade barriers are one of the highest in the world. That's very easily seen in India, at least back in the old days, where they maintained very high trade barriers. In North Korea, and practically anywhere in the world, you see a simple and easy relationship. High trade barriers means slowly growing, poor, weak economy. Low trade barrier means relatively rich economy, and countries like Singapore and Hong Kong, which I explained in the previous lecture, with minimalist trade barriers would basically mean 
mean that they would be growing the fastest and relatively richest. So, trade number one, uh, sorry, trend number one driving globalization has been declining trade barriers. Trend number two is declining investment barriers. When I write this little sign, tilde, means same as the above, declining and then barriers, okay? Declining investment barriers. Similarly, for example, my home country, Bulgaria, has realized that keeping capital out is not really good, that we need to encourage capital to move in. So many poor and developing countries understand easily that they don't have enough capital. The source of capital is savings. And poor countries don't have enough resources to save in order to reinvest in their own economy. So poor, com uh, poor economies understand that they need to attract foreign capital. And therefore, they, most of the times, willingly will lower their own barriers to foreign capital. Again, when we say investment, we basically mean capital, okay? Capital is the source of investment. In other words, when you invest, you build capital, okay? It's, it, it works both ways. So that's number two, okay, okay, that's pretty much it. Okay. Number three is technology. And within technology, you got communications. Such as high speed internet networks, like fiber optic, uh, satellite communications, okay? These allow for very high uh, data transfer. With data transfer and high speed of transfer, you have a high speed of computer processing, so we have information processing. So communication means fast data transfer. This one would mean fast processing of the data. As the data comes in, you can process it very quickly. And let's see what's number one. Oh, sorry, number three is transportation. Within information processing, the big one is the microcomputer and then the personal computer. You all know it, you're all familiar with. Let's do a little bit on the transportation. Within transportation, the big thing which has changed the world is called containerization. So you use containers. In other words, it is the development of shipping across the oceans and the big commercial uh, ships which ship goods, but the shipping, the big thing which is actually very difficult to understand, it took me a while ago, it took me a long time to understand that the key to this whole thing is the standardization in the world of the size of shipping containers. When the container is standardized, you have now the ship, you can arrange the containers next to each other and on top of each other, okay? You ship them around, each container is clearly marked, and then when the container reaches Hong Kong, it just gets removed from one ship and moved to another ship. 
let's discuss this little piece of information which is important for you to understand. It's called, and use the French word, entrepôt. Entrepôt. Sometimes I think they use here French thing. All right. Entrepôt is a trading post where a lot of goods uh, goods get get shipped to, and then they get reshuffled, moved to another places, and shipped somewhere else around the world. Okay, so it's like an intermediate spot for transportation. The biggest one, well, the biggest two today in the world are Hong Kong and Singapore. They work very similarly. Goods coming from Europe get shipped to Hong Kong. From Hong Kong, they get redistributed to other ships, and from there they go to China, or they go to Korea, or they go to Japan, or they go to some other Asian countries. Similarly, Asian goods, they don't go from Korea straight to Germany or to any other European country. They move usually to Hong Kong or they move to Singapore. Then the container gets moved onto another ship and then moves to Europe or possibly the United States. So the entrepôt actually uh, uh, introduces extraordinary efficiency and reduction in cost. The other one which uh, introduces the reduction in cost is the container. A standard container now allows you to move container from one ship to another ship and allows the rapid rise of entrepôt. Because now with a standard container, it's easy to move the container from one ship to another ship. Everything to be automatically done. You already know, everything's calculated. You know when the ship's arriving. You know how many containers you move. You know that when you take the container, it's got exactly the same standard size. You can move it very easy. So this means extraordinary reduction in the cost of transportation. And this means the rise of cheap transportation where transportation cost is no longer prohibitive to global trade. So the development of transportation was driven by the standardization of ship containers. Okay. The next piece within the transportation is the so-called jet travel. And jet tra jets are relatively small airplanes. You got them two types. One is commercial jet travel, where you load the jet with specific commercial goods, okay, and you ship them across the world. It's quick, it's very <coughs> amazingly efficient, and it's relatively cheap. You don't have a lot of these. You know, it, uh, the, the, the fuel doesn't cost as much. You don't have 20 or 30 people personnel. The jet's got only two or three people inside. It's very easy to organize. It's relatively small. It doesn't need huge airports, okay, so it can land more easily. So jet travel has been very, very important in being able to move spare and other parts around the world relatively quickly and relatively efficiently. Okay, so that's the jet travel. And finally, the last piece which is also important part is the what we now know as the low cost travel, where if you're now here in Phuket, you can fly to Singapore and back for one hundred euro for a two-way ticket. One hundred euro, or well, one hundred and twenty for a two-way uh, ticket. So low-cost travel now changes a lot in terms of tourism, in terms of services, and a number of other things. Now, if your home market is really blocked, you can literally go to another country and there buy the good a lot cheaper. Example, your other 
lecturer, which is teaching you in international finance, just came back from Japan. He, come on girls, hey. He just came back from Japan. He was very interested in buying himself an e-book. And e-books happen to be relatively expensive here. So he did his own research on the internet. Again, that's the communications part, okay? And he said, oh man, in Japan they're relatively cheap. You can buy cheap Sony and you can buy cheap Kobo, even though Kobo is at least a Canadian company. And guess what? He checked what's happening in Singapore. He's traveling from time to time there. And then he finally decided, okay, well, we're gonna go with my wife, with his wife, meaning. Anyway, to, uh, all right, uh, anyway, he's gonna be going to uh, Japan. I'm gonna buy it there. And he just came back a couple of days ago and he said, hey, let me show you my new Kobo. It's a very nice, he loved it and whatnot. And he said, it's amazingly cheap. All right, well, there you have it, low cost travel. He's doing other things. But anyway, by the way, he did his shopping. He knows what he wants to buy. And his research, hey, it's cheapest to buy in Japan. And he does shopping from there. Yet another little trend that affects uh, all of these things. OK, well, what about low cost travel? Well, it's very cheap for a Bulgarian to go to Germany and a lot of Bulgarians go Germany in Germany to do shopping. Well, what kind of shopping can you do in Germany? Well, the answer is we go there and we buy BMWs. All right, so you go there, you circle around specific areas, the one you like, you buy, and you just drive it back home. We do this a lot. Of course, we have the same thing with professional dealers, but for us Bulgarians, it's very common to go to Italy or Germany or Switzerland because of the low cost travel and usually two guys they'll go with the bus and hopefully they'll buy one or maybe two cars and they'll just drive them back home. No big deal. I mean it's easy. It's very straightforward. And how much is, is a bus cost? Maybe, well maybe 50 euro a person. Really, really cheap to go all the way to Vienna or to Germany <coughs> or to Italy. Low cost travel. And it can even also fly. Yeah. What about airplane tickets? 60 Euro, 60 euro from Bulgaria to Vienna, 60, 70 euro one way to Germany or one way to Switzerland or one way to Italy. And they just buy one way and then if they don't buy a car, they can just take a bus back. So that's yet another little thing going on. All right, let's see what else we got. We got this, yeah, World Wide Web. Why not? Let's put the World Wide Web. This is where I gave you the example. The guy is doing his research and find out what's going on. Now, you got these things going on. They're somewhat illegal in the United States where Americans checking on their medicine turns out to be terribly expensive. And when they try to find it, oh, man, it's so much cheaper in Canada. Why? Because in the US, it raises a lot of barriers to imports, okay? So you cannot import the medicine from any other country. In other words, they impose restrictions to trade. They cartelize the industry. The industry imposes a cartel, jacks up the prices sky high, and then you're just milking the consumer and milking the insurance companies where the pharmaceuticals make big profit at the expense of the consumer and at the expense of the insurance companies. Of course, it is not the expense of insurance companies. Insurance companies charge it back to consumer and to businesses again. Insurance companies are still going to make a profit. So the ultimate cost is always paid by the, the higher cost by the consumer. So these guys go and say, oh man, Canada is so much cheaper. So they make a little order and the Canadians ship it back to the US. Well, that's well done and there's no problem at all, okay? So that's one way uh, to do it. The other way to do it is the American will just go to Canada, buy his pills there, and then tra travel back to, back to the United States, all right? But this is given, you know, possible by the World Wide Web because you can do the research there and find where it's cheaper 
to actually do it. Same thing, you need to get your teeth done, you can do everything over the web to do your research, find out, schedule, call, everything's cut from the beginning till the very end. Okay, so that's a very important trend. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Jet travel, generalization, okay. All right, well, the result of all of this is what is known as the global village. Global village is simply a term to describe that the world is now relatively small, that you can travel anywhere to the world quickly and easily, that there are no restrictions to travel, there are no restrictions to goods, that you can buy whichever good you want, you can buy whichever pill you want, you can go and get the service, the healthcare service anywhere in the world that you think would be best and so on. So the world due to globalization is, become, is becoming one giant global village and globalization is also, it's actually a two-way process. Globalization creates a global culture and global culture drives globalization but you have the creation what is known and I discussed a little bit global culture. Alright, and this completes section 4. Now we're moving to page 17, section 5. Demographics. <coughs> so, changing world output and the world trade picture. After World War II, Germany is destroyed, most of Europe is destroyed. You have only one economy standing, or Japan is destroyed, only one standing economy, and that's the US. The US has profited from the war, okay? The, most of the countries, you gotta understand, the US banks loved World War II, why? You finance both sides at the same time, and it doesn't matter who wins, you get to have the countries pay you back anyway. So, Germans got to pay back, and of course, Britishers, and everybody's got to pay back too. So, United States was an extraordinary profiteer from World War II, and its economy was the one that wasn't destroyed. So after World War II, the US economy stood as the only strong economy around the world, and it had to rebuild slowly but steadily European economy, Japanese economy. You don't have any other Asian economies that were developed at that time. So the US was the ultimate and the global, the only, the sole leader in the world. So the demographics have been fairly simple. It has been the relative decline of the U.S. economy since the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on. And it's been the relative rise of number one, Japan, number two, the European economies, especially Germany, and in the 50s and 60s, France, okay? And in the 80s and 90s, the Asian tigers, which are, again, I covered them last time, Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea, and Taiwan. So it has been driven, so the last 30 years, of the rise of Asian economic powers. The last 20 years have been the rise of China, and it's been the steady and relative decline of the U.S. Well, why the relative decline? Well, this is controversial, but the basics of economics are astonishingly simple. Maintaining an empire with 800 military bases around the world is extremely costly. It sucks capital from production, 
to doing extremely unproductive things like military operations, military bases, and so on. Here's a good example. Uh, there has been, and there's still in Germany, a bunch of American military bases. And the question is, why Eastern Germany is not a threat anymore? Russia is not a threat anymore. Bulgaria is certainly not a threat, right? And there is no threat, right? But they maintain the base anyway. All right, well, why? Okay, the question is different. The question, the answer is, we're worried about the decline of US. It sucks capital to the point where Ford it no, does not have enough capital to invest and be a productive in the leader. GM is not a productive as much. And uh, Chrysler is not productive as much. The leaders today are Japanese automakers and German automakers, okay? So when the economy diverts four, five, six hundred, seven hundred billion of dollars into military operations, these 700 billion are not available to produce cars and to produce other goods and services in the economy. So the extensive military expenditures in investments means a lot lower investments in production and trade and productivity. And that's a very simple, very uh, basic reason of the relative decline of the US. Now, what about the relative? Okay, I'm still trying to tell you a story, all right? Maybe, maybe a little boring, but it's, you know, because that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, so, uh, what about the relative rise of the Asian superpowers? And the answer is the extraordinarily high savings rate. Koreans are very thrifty, they save a lot, and whatever they say, they reinvest, okay? Same thing with Taiwanese. They save a lot, and whatever they say, they reinvest. Well, that's fundamentally the reason, uh, the reason for the rise and strength of the German economy has been the relative thriftiness of Germans and using that amount of capital to reinvest in their own productivity to be able to compete globally. Again, competition comes from only one place, higher and better productivity. And higher and better productivity comes from only one place, better capital. And better capital comes from savings. And if you spend too much like the US, you don't have the capital base to grow productivity and competitiveness, and you lose relative competitiveness over time. So the rise of these, Okay, so now, so let's write here the tiger, Asian tigers, tiger economies. And over the last 20 years, you got the rise of what is known as the tiger cub. What is a cub? A cub is a tiny little tiger. So which are the tiger cub economies which are rapidly rising over the last 20 years? And these would be Philippines rising fast, Indonesia growing and rising fast, Thailand growing and rising fast. Let's pay respect to your home country. Vietnam growing and rising fast, right? So when I was when I was teaching in Taiwan, and of course I'm having a whole bunch of like 50 Taiwanese students, and I say, hey, so where are you guys investing these days? I mean, Taiwanese big businesses and they got a lot of money and they make money and okay, and they have capital. Or where are you investing, guys? And they say, oh, number one place is Vietnam. Okay? They still have a good quality labor, and it's still a whole lot cheaper. And I ask them, well, what about Thailand? They say, oh no, no, Thailand is getting relatively expensive. In other words, Thailand was one of the first of the tiger cub economies. It has gotten relatively expensive, so capital is 
always seeking the cheaper places where to invest. So right now, well, even recently, China was a very, very cheap place. But with the growth of the Chinese economy, costs in China have substantially risen. So capital is now moving to other economies. Now the attractive places are Vietnam. The attractive places are still Indonesia, where cost of labor is relatively low. Uh, you will have a case study about Indonesia, where I've prepared for you a very, very nice documentary. I'll post it next time uh, to your uh, to the computer class computer, and I'll provide you with the links uh, on the LMS system so that you can get to watch them. I'll give you assignment later on. All right, so th this is the demographics of the economies themselves. Well, what about investments? Investments after World War, World War II came mostly from the United States. After that, as the European economy were able to stand on their feet again in the 60s and especially in the 70s, capital started flowing out of Western Europe all over the world, again, some in Latin America, some in Asia, some in, well, not so much in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe would be right after the Berlin <coughs> Wall, the fall of the Berlin Wall, okay? So, uh, investments will be, the major source will be the U.S. in the early days, the early decades after the World War II. Then, the capital source will be Western Europe. And later on, the capital source will be Japan and other Asian economies. But Japan, Japan was a very advanced economy. It has huge savings rate. And the huge savings rate, they could not profitably reinvest in their own country. So they reinvested in other countries. So Japan has been a tremendous source of capital and investment from around the world. Uh, some other uh, economies that have been growing fast besides the tiger, uh, uh, tiger cup economies will be Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and the so-called, again, let's write them out, BRICS. Uh, let's do the thing and write the BRICS with S at the end, where S stands for anybody? Anybody? All right. This one's Brazil, easy. This one's Russia, easy. This one's India, easy. This one's China, easy. And S stands for? Oh, excellent. South Africa, excellent. I'm very, very pleasantly surprised. Yes, indeed, South Africa, but let's add Mexico. Mexico has been part of the North American Free Trade Association, North American Free Trade Association, known as NAFTA. And as soon as borders between the US, Canada, and Mexico fell, the result has been massive increase in investments in Mexico, and Mexico has become a major exporter, including, as I mentioned last time, German investments in Mexico for the purpose of exporting to the US and Canadian market. And I gave you the example with the BMW <coughs> X5 as one example. OK, we got that one done. OK, changing multinational enterprises. So here, so the first section was about the economies. OK, the second section was about the investments. And now is the section on M&A. M&A is what I've been using over and over and over, is multinational enterprise. It's simply in a business that has activities or operations in a number of countries, in multiple countries. It could be basic exports. It could be 
investments, it could be production, it could be a lot of things. We're going to be talking a lot about them. So, the MEs has followed investments in capital. On the first level, they were the U.S. corporations. They dominated the world after World War II. They were the only one left standing. Then, as a second step, were the Western European mega corporations. You know them: Volvo, Renault, Peugeot, Bayer, BMW, Mercedes. Number three will be the Japanese. Of course, they are the carriers of capital. If a country has a capital, the capital will be carried to another country through the multinational enterprises. So these will coincide. If a country's got a lot of capital and it's got a lot of capital to export to make foreign investments, it will be done with the multinational enterprises, M&Es. And now you also have also the Middle East will be occasionally exporting capital. We call these petrodollars or oil money, right? These are their monies and revenues that come from oil. Okay. Uh, but they don't have M&Es, they just export capital without multinational enterprises. But they are growing their own, uh, their own national oil companies, okay? Let's see what else we got. Non-US multinationals. And the latest trend is the rise of many multinationals. So early on, these are the mega or mega corporations. These are huge monsters with tens of billions of revenues. Now we got the rise of mini multinationals, who are a relatively small firm of, let's say, 100 or 200 people, is producing a specialty product, some type of a special furniture, and they export it around the world due to cheaper transport. So you got a lot of uh, mini multinationals. A mini multinational could be a tourist agency company that is arranging for travels around the world. They're going to have only 50 or 100 people, and everything else will be contracts with their partners. Okay, let's see what else we got. And I already discussed this. That's on page 24. That's uh, part of this. Part of the demographics is the changing world order. And the changing world order is associated with, again, let me repeat, the fall of communism and opening of Eastern Europe. The opening and the market approach of China which China undertook in the 80s. So it's the political change in China in the 80s, which opened up China for what we see today, China becoming the global leading economy around the world. Okay, the world. And changes in Southeast Asia, where it just, you know, it just gets to become common sense. And finally, Latin America. So what should we expect in the 21st century? Fairly straightforward. You'd expect that China will be, very soon, the leading dominant economy in the world. So again, China was from somewhere 100 around the world. It has quickly risen to become number three. A couple of years ago, maybe three or four years ago, they reported that Chinese economy has surpassed Japanese economy and is now number two uh, in terms of US dollars. But when you count in terms of irons, in terms of phones, in terms of cars, in terms of motorcycles, in terms of bicycles, China is in many ways already number one in the world. Now, in terms of laptops, in terms of computers, in terms of roads, in terms of road network, in terms of airports. Solar energy. 
Hmm? Yes, now they're moving into, uh, let's call it not just solar, alternative energy. They are moving into every kind of alternative energy because they understand clearly that energy drives an economy and that an economy is built on energy. So they understand they don't have enough oil. They're developing nuclear energy and are becoming a leader of nuclear energy. Uh, yeah, let's write it out so you have some little fun. They are developing these called pebble bed reactors. Pebble bed reactors are very small. They're way smaller than this uh, room. You can put them in a closet. They are easily transportable. You can put it in a truck and move it on to another place. They have seven layers of safety and security, so they're extraordinarily safe, anywhere between thousand and million times safer than the current uh, energy. And, you know, a little pebble bed reactor like this desk over here can run about a small town. And now these guys are developing and trying to commercialize, and they're trying to produce them in the thousands. Of course, they're working on solar energy. They, for a long time, have been the leader in solar energy. They're trying to develop wind energy. They're trying to develop social, oh, sorry, ocean energy from the movement of the ocean and so on. So these guys are working hard, so they're going to be very soon, maybe three, maybe five, maybe eight years, will be the dominant economy in the world. Uh, let's discuss a little bit more about multinationals and the global trends. Global trends are fairly, fairly, fairly clear. U.S. is going down and down and down and down and down and is the easiest forecast in the world, okay? Because of rising social welfare, rising government, rising military expenses. This is known as the rise of the welfare warfare state, where 90% of government goes to welfare and to warfare. Now, what is the meaning of welfare? The economic meaning of welfare is paying people not to work. That's it. You pay them not to work. All right? And what's the economic meaning of warfare? Is paying people to kill other people. Okay? So, in other words, 90% of the government's budget goes for extraordinarily unproductive activities. The government is not investing in its own economy, and the government is wasting its own resources. Well, number two easiest forecast in the world is UK. UK is going down and down and down and down, and maybe going down faster than the US, because the UK government is doing the same stupid stuff like the US government. Number three easy forecast is Japan. It's going down and down and down. Not as fast, but again, uh, the government is going deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. It has gone like four, three times deeper than the U.S. and the U.K. and any other government. The whole economy is getting much deeper into that. Uh, you probably don't hear or don't know that the most indebted government in the world is the Japanese government. They never, ever have a chance of repaying back their debt. And they're never going to stand back on their feet unless their whole economy crashes and they rebuild it back from scratch like Germany did after World War II. Japan is stuck in two old ways which are proven not to work. Yes, in the 50s it worked. In the 60s it really worked well. In the 70s they were about to rule the world. But over time they have been extremely inflexible and incapable to adjust and modify to overall global realities to the point where Japan is going down, okay? So, what else can we see? 
Korea is going up, up, and up. The Koreans are doing everything right. Well, I mean, they got their little problems, but they are small. China is bound to go up, up, and up. Now, China is still developing a credit bubble, is still developing a real, well, has developed a real estate bubble, is still developing a banking bubble, and China will go through a major recession or a major depression. And usually after the depression, it will re-emerge as the global leader of the world, okay? Economic leader, and of course, down the road, cultural leader and military. Yeah, for military, it may take them 30 years, but these are the trends and they're easy to see. Who else is good doing well? Hong Kong, they have proven to be doing well. They're using a good model. They will be doing well. Singapore will be doing well. Now, what about Europe? Europe is doing Bad. Europe is going down, down, down. It's a, in moral, cultural, economic, political, in every kind of decline, Europe has it. Europe has it not as bad as the US, but they got everything going bad for it. Okay? And within Europe, the southern countries, the Mediterranean, known as Club Med. Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal is in terrible shape, okay? They're going to live through a terrible depression. And the economies that are holding well are Norway and Germany is still holding somewhat well. France is in terrible shape. France is <coughs> on the brink of a major catastrophe and a major collapse. Of course, you're not going to hear this on European media, they like to portray France as a pillar of Europe. But France got way, way, way too many problems. Too much debt, too much government, extremely inflexible government, too much bureaucracy, too much protectionism, so many problems. So the French economy is in serious trouble. Some Eastern European economies will be growing a little better, okay? They have good education system, they get good health care, they get good infrastructure, okay? And most of the other Eastern European economies are not going to be doing well. The hardest forecast in the world and the most difficult to understand and to see is Russia. Russia. For India, India has so many problems that India will not be a superpower. They got a terrible government. They got a terrible corruption. Corruption everywhere. They got built-in cultural, inf social inflexibility where it cannot move from strata to strata to the point which is choking society, choking opportunity choking people with brains and choking people with capital to the point where India is never going to rise to be a major dominant global player. And more likely, as we see now, or as you've probably heard, uh, is it time? Oh, time to go home, right? Okay. Uh, India, in, in Indian economy has tremendous problems. Over the last three months, the Indian currency has crashed and the Indian government is just doing everything wrong, okay? Now, it comes to doing things wrong, number one in the world has always been the Indian government. After World War II, Indian government took their special way and they did everything wrong for 30 years where they've proven that if you do these things, we know they're wrong, the results will be disastrous. Well, now they're going back their old ways, doing all the wrong things. So India is not likely to be doing well. Guys, good enough for today? Yeah. All right, okay, we'll continue tomorrow. Uh, oh, not tomorrow, next time. <laughs> all right, well, maybe see you Wednesday on the beach, right? Okay.